Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, regular meeting of the City Council of the City of Dana Point, July 18, 2017. We've just uh, been in our closed session and now we're reconvening to our open session. So uh, we will do the Pledge of Allegiance and then the uh, Associate Pastor Jen Christie of Capitol Beach Church will lead us in an invocation. So if you would stand for the pledge, please, and remaining, and uh, Mr. Tomlinson? Yes, I do want to do that, Mayor. Please repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, you know better than us that the world wasn't made for hatred or pain. You're the one who knew our human race from the very beginning, the one who breathed life into our dust and called us very good. You know just how beautiful we were intended to be. We bring before you tonight the disunity of today's world, the absurd violence and the many wars which are breaking the courage of the peoples of this world. Greed and injustice breed hatred. Lord, bring an end to violence and discord. Bring justice to the downtrodden and hope to the hopeless. Guide all those in positions of power and give them wisdom to use their power wisely. Give us all the grace to admit when we are wrong and give us grace to forgive. Give us courage to love one another even when love seems like a risk and give us compassion for those who are unlike us and teach us to listen to those with whom we disagree. We pray to you not as someone distant and aloof, but as someone near to us, even in the midst of chaos. We don't have to shout to get your attention. So send your spirit and renew the face of the earth and give us the peace which the world cannot give in his name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Christie. Okay, this is the part where we do presentations and proclamations, so uh, I will go up front. Okay, first proclamation, Ocean Institute, nonprofit of the year. So Mary Larson, where, ah, hello, welcome. All right, let me give you the right plaque. Yeah, I know, it's official. Come on over here, everybody has to see you. Okay. Welcome, welcome. So we would like to recognize the uh, Ocean Institute, our favorite nonprofit. And uh, people might not know, okay, California nonprofits generate $260 billion a year in uh, economic activity. And that uh, the nonprofit is the fourth largest private employer in California. And that the California nonprofits bring $50 billion into the state every year from out of state and that there are 72,000 nonprofits. Yeah, I know, amazing, huh? So uh, the Ocean Institute was selected by Senator Patricia Bates as her district's nonprofit of the year. And it's recently been, uh, the Ocean Institute has traveled to Sacramento to participate uh, with uh, the legislators in California's Nonprofit Day. So I just want you to say, I want to say to you, we're very proud of our Ocean Institute. We're so glad you're here. And uh, very proud to be able to give you this recognition. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. 
We love being a part of this community and we're very grateful for Dana Point's support and it's our 40th anniversary this year and, and hope to be around for another 40 years and then some. So thank you very much. It means a lot. Thank you. And then, oh, sorry, Jenny. thank you. Uh, let me start again. So you were hired as a part-time uh, public works intern at our city, and then you were promoted to a senior administrative assistant. And then in 2017, you served as a temporary assignment in the Natural Resource uh, Protection Office. And now you've returned to your regular position as senior administrative assistant in the public works department. So you're very task oriented and the city wants, to, wants you to know that we're very proud of you and we're very pleased and we'd like to recognize your services and, and that's why interns are great. Yeah. That's right, I <laughs> started as an intern and now look where you are. So we would like to say uh, we're proud of you and thank you for contributing to our city. I mean, thank you very much. It means a lot. I, um, it's easy to work hard when everyone else around you is working really hard, too. So, yeah, great. Thank you. Hi, I'm artist Kay Hyens, my husband. Bob Kahan, and we're very proud of her, and we love this city. We've lived here for quite some time, and I want you to know how odd, how, how amazing is it that when the city was incorporated that same year she was born. Very nice. Very nice. Can you stand next to your daughter? Thank you, and thank you both for coming. Very proud of your daughter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but certainly not least, we have a certificate of recognition to Heather Johnston. You probably all know this woman. I see you brought your fan club. <laughs> so, we understand that you are... Somebody actually leaves Dana Point. We are um, actually moving back to Mammoth. I met my husband, Matt, up in Mammoth, and um, we've had the pleasure of living down here in South County for 15 years, and um, we are now moving back up to Mammoth, and we're going to miss Dana Point every day. <laughs> okay, but when I come up and ski, yes. <laughs> I will expect give to me, see give you. Give me time to get my ski legs back. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> well, we are all going to miss you. And in recognition of all your service for the city of Dana Point and the Chamber of Commerce, we wanted you to take just a little bit of us with you. And uh, a certificate of recognition, you know, basically says how wonderful you are, <laughs> how much we love you, and how much we're going to miss you. This will go right over our bed so that everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think I want to hear that. TMI, sorry. <laughs> no, way too much. <laughs> So, you'd like to say something? <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that um, 
that this is the 70th year for the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce. And um, so we are have been around the block. And it is something that um, if it hadn't been for the support of um, city council, for our state partners, our county partners, that when I started, just has been an incredible support system for me. Um, I especially want to thank my staff. My staff is here, and um, these ladies look make, make us look good every single day. I'm really going to miss them. And my board of directors, these, um, this is a group that volunteers countless hours to make sure we have a strong chamber. Strong chamber is imperative for a strong business community. And um, I want to especially say to the city staff, and Killebrew, you're part of this, um, that, <laughs> yeah, you're a big part of it, that when um, I started, um, there was several issues that needed to be handled in the Chamber of Commerce, and it wasn't for, if it wasn't for the city staff and for Sheriff Department and the council and your support, um, we certainly wouldn't be where we are right now. And so thank you so very, very much for everything that you guys have done. Um, I know that there's been a lot of contention lately, but I did want to say that um, this is the best city I've ever worked with. And um, these are employees that come in here and they give 110% every single day. And um, they, um, I hope our Dana Point residents really appreciate that because I know our businesses do. Again, thank you for this honor, Madam Mayor, and um, I will miss you all. <laughs> Come on, Mr. Johnson, come on, come on. You're not going to get off that easy. How about the rest of your fan yes. club? Come on. Yes, please, come on, ladies. We can give your uh, camera to somebody if you want. We'll get it from yeah. Diane. Diane will take it, too. Don't you want to come on? Yeah, come on up. Come on, come on. Kim is our... our Chairwoman of the board. We'll hold your flowers. <laughs> so we wanted to present that to oh. Heather as well. And we also wanted to uh, thank the city and staff on behalf of the chamber board and uh, its members for welcoming Heather, first of all, and also helping her through um, her beginnings and then kind of her taking the ball and rolling with it and then her directing you guys what to do. So that's a good thing. So um, we appreciate your, your help and um, your staff with Turkey Trot and everything that the chamber does as well. So thank you for recognizing her. Our pleasure. Okay. Oh, well, you got to be in the picture. Okay. Oh, okay. This is Killebrew. He doesn't have a first name. <laughs> <laughs> and let's introduce. Oh, hi. My name is Katie. I work with the Dana Point Chamber of Commerce as the special event coordinator and sponsorship coordinator. Hi, I'm Michelle Zorn, and I am your membership coordinator. I'm Ashley Von Gremp, and I do our communications and marketing, and I'm the uh, communication or community engagement manager. I'm Matt. Killebrew. Lewis. Madam Mayor, <laughs> Mike. Yeah, we have one. Oh. Yeah, wait, 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 wait. We have one more. We have one more. Okay, Barbara, where are you? Barbara. Let me introduce Barbara Johannes. I'm Barbara Johannes, and I live in Dana Point, and I uh, have the privilege of being president of the Dana Point Historical Society, and there are about five or six board members here with me this evening, and we want to wish Heather the best, and um, you're returning to um, home territory, but we want you to remember us. It's chillier up there, isn't it? It is. So um, our sunshine chair... Judy Henderson had this wonderful idea. So if you will pull on that, pull on this. I'll, 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 we'll oh. hold the bag. Yeah, okay, here we go. Oh, this is amazing. And, uh, and if you hold it up, you'll see that it has, it, are we upside down or right side up? Oh, we're good. Yeah, it's an app. Yeah, it's, I think it's, a, oh, okay, yeah, sorry. Okay, so those are all the things to remind you of Dana Point, the Pilgrim, the Blue Lantern Gazebo, the 
um, the lanterns of Dana Point, the Droger statue, Richard Henry Dana, on and on, and it should help you keep warm <laughs> wherever you put it. You. <laughs> <laughs> Heather's been great, and she always answers everything with a smile. You were super, you and your staff, helping us with the Orange County anniversary, uh, Dana Point Harbor anniversary. It was fantastic last year, so thank you very thank much. You. Here's your tissue. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody gets a going away gift. <laughs> hey, we could use Barbara. Where are you? We could use one of those uh, Afghans. It gets cold in here sometimes. <laughs> just, just, just a thought, you know. Just a, just a hint. <laughs> I know, and it's so interesting. <laughs> okay. okay. All right, next item on our calendar is the consent calendar. So all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be enacted with one roll call vote. There's no separate discussion of these items unless the members of the city council, the public, or the staff uh, request that a specific item or item be removed from the consent calendar. So does anyone from the council want to remove something from the consent calendar? Okay, that would be me. I would like to remove item, uh, let's see. I guess that would be the regular minutes of the 20th. Is that what we're talking about, Mr. City Attorney? Okay, so I would like to remove item two. Um, I have had questions on another item, item seven, but I spoke with Mr. Denny and Killebrew. You are now forever Killebrew, you know. <laughs> I spoke with Mr. Denny and Mr. Killebrew and my questions were answered, so I'm only going to remove item two which is the regular meeting minutes of June 20. Does staff have any item that they'd like to remove? No, Madam Mayor. And how about any member of the public? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. So um, then I would ask if there is a, a vote to move the consent calendar except for item two. Madam Mayor, I'll move that the balance of the consent calendar. Thank you. And a second? I'll second it. Okay. And a vote? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, so I've removed item two, and uh, Mr. City Attorney, if you would please clear up for us just a, um, um, something that was a little confusing with our last minutes, and we had a discussion on it, because there was a closed session on June t uh, 6th, and um, at the June 6th, Mr. Miller was absent. But prior to that, we had a vote, so if you would like to just clarify that for us on the settlement. Yes, yeah, so um, the mayor's asked that I kind of explain what occurred that led to the discussion we had at the last meeting on the minutes and what the confusion is. And so in order to fully understand it, I kind of put together a little timeline of the things that occurred so that um, we can kind of make this clear once and for all. So on the council meeting on May 16th, uh, there was a subcommittee of the city council made of the mayor and mayor pro tem that were negotiating uh, the settlement agreement on the Headlands matter. They presented the status of the settlement and um, there was a discussion which ultimately led the council approving the terms that are in the final agreement, uh, this final settlement agreement that's been made a public record. Uh, that agreement was approved on a five vote on May 16th. 
It wasn't a final action at that time because we were still waiting for final approval and signature from the Headlands and Mr. Edward. Uh, we were still in the process of negotiations that evening. We weren't sure, you know, where we would be. Um, as a result, there was no requirement to report that evening pursuant to the Brown Act, uh, section 54957.1A3B basically indicates that when uh, the council approves a settlement um, that you don't have to make an announcement if it's not a final action that evening, if it's, if it is contingent on becoming final on the actions of some third party outside of the city, which is what we had here. Um, what you are required to do is if and once it becomes final, um, then you have to make it available as a public record. So around May 24th and May 25th, I had some email exchanges with the mayor. Um, she contacted me and indicated that she was wondering if we were going to report out. Um, and I explained to her that per the code section I just discussed that um, we wouldn't be reporting out because it wasn't a final action at that time. And all we needed to do was make the document available upon request. Part of the settlement agreement included a press release um, that was uh, you know, kind of a joint release the parties had agreed upon and so the public would have been made aware of the agreement without the need for specifically reporting out. Um, the mayor indicated to me that she thought it was important that the public hear from the council about the settlement, not read about it in the media, and so um, asked if uh, we could delay releasing uh, the information until after the next meeting so we could make an announcement. And that was an issue because the agreement required that once all the signatures were in place, that uh, within a week that the press release would be um, issued. So um, the mayor contacted Mr. Edward and secured an agreement from him that it would be okay with him if we wait until after the meeting on June 6th to uh, release the press release. So uh, on the meeting of June 6th, uh, which occurred with uh, Councilmember Miller absent, um, in, we had a closed session and without you know, revealing any confidential information about our discussions, I can say that you know, we kind of discussed the status and after the closed session, I announced that uh, the council had reached uh, a settlement and that the agreement would be public in the morning as well as a press release. Um, the, um, at the meeting of June 20th, we had the minutes presented, uh, the minutes of the June 6th meeting. Uh, prior, uh, so staff prepares the, the meeting minutes and staff had prepared the minutes for the June uh, 6th meeting to be presented at the June 20th meeting. Um, the mayor received those in advance and edited them in a way that gave the impression that the council had approved the settlement on June 6th in closed session on a five to zero vote. Um, staff just didn't pick up on the error. Um, and then this led to the confusion, you know, because Councilmember Miller wasn't even here that evening. Um, the vote really hadn't occurred on June 6th with respect to the settlement. Um, and uh, as a result, the, uh, the discussion we had in the last meeting about, well, this doesn't quite seem right occurred. So um, the, the operative moving parts are that on May 16th, we did approve the settlement on a 5-0 vote, but we were not required to report that out. A decision was made that um, th uh, there was a desire to have an opportunity to report out that the settlement had occurred, which did occur on the meeting of June 6th, although we didn't announce the vote that night, we simply said that it had been approved. Um, the, you know, there was an error that ended up in the minutes, um, which just hadn't got picked up on that led to the confusion. So I hope that that uh, clarifies what has occurred um, and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Mr. Miller. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Munoz, this brings up uh, an issue I've, I've raised a couple of times over our minutes. Um, you know, this set of minutes is 30 pages long. I mean, the minutes are not designed to be a play-by-play -play of what happens in a council meeting. And, and I think we really need to, to you know, discuss having just pure summary minutes where, you know, you talk, it, it shows what the agenda item was, what the motions were, how the votes came down, and then immediately after that, show the link to the video of those, of, of that agenda item, and, and that become our true minutes, so we don't have to go through this. It, it seems like we've gone through a couple different meetings now where we're, we're discussing what actually happened, who said what, um, it, it just, 
I don't know if that's productive or not. And, you know, I've mentioned it before, we, we have this problem with other, on other boards that I sit on, and, and we've made that motion that, you know, they should just become summary, give a link to the video, if we can do that. I don't know if, if that's available to us or not, but I, I think that's something we need to discuss to make sure that if people want to know what happened, go to the video and see what happened. I mean, so we don't have to go through this. I agree that vote was 5-0. I, it, it confused me when I, when I saw it because I wasn't even there and it came out as 5-0. I don't know how it got in there, um, but, but that would just eliminate some of those types of mistakes. And I don't know if there's a motion for that, if we have to agendize making, uh, creating a policy like that. Well, it sounds to me like a suggestion that staff could bring back in connection with the minutes a, um, a as a discussion item, uh, a discussion of how you want your minutes to be prepared and, and what you want them to look like. If that's the, the procedure Th for it. That yes. would be procedurally the right way to do that. All right. Thank you. That's, do I need a motion to direct staff to do that? How, how does that work? I think we just direct staff. To, we can just. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to direct staff to do that. Yes, and then it'll be agendized on another on another council meeting. We'll discuss it and, okay. Madam Mayor, I do have a question. Uh, yes, Mr. Um, Thomas. Since, since we're on the minutes, how long did it take to prepare these minutes? Madam Clerk? It's hard to say how many hours. It's probably somewhere between 10 and 16 or something okay. like that, at least not including the review of them. Now, okay. in fairness, this was, a, this was the meeting where we sat here till 1 in the morning, right? So, 1.30, yes. So, our meetings are not usually that bad. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay. So, now I need a motion to approve the minutes as, well, I guess the minutes stay the way they are, and then what Mr. Uh, Munoz has just clarified will be in the next set of minutes. So uh, I need a motion to approve uh, the minutes that were taken out, item two of the consent calendar. So moved, Madam Mayor. Second. Second. Motion carries 5-0. Um, Madam Clerk, do we have any ordinances to read uh, off at this time? Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. We do not. We have no ordinance titles to read this evening. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. This is the portion of the meeting that we open to public comment. Uh, public comment is anyone in the audience is welcome to come up and speak to us on any item that is not on our agenda. So whatever you have on your mind, feel free. This is your three minutes of fame. Uh, we ask that you keep it to three minutes per person and that um, you Keep your comments civil, not directed at anybody or no personal tax. We will equal, e likewise be civil to you, listen to you, and um, take in what you have to say. Please understand that if an item is not on the agenda, we are not allowed under law, the Brown Act, to discuss it. So what we will do is listen, and um, we, it may come up at a later time, but we can't comment and we can't discuss the item um, if you come up and talk to us. So I think uh, if you have any handouts and that you haven't already given them to uh, Ms. Ward, our city clerk, please hand them to her as you come up and she will distribute them to us. Okay, I will, uh, oh, we have lots of public comments. So I will read out uh, two names and then you guys can come in that order and then I will read some more names. Um, so. And there's a buzzer that will tell you when your time is up. And I would just ask that you, you know, try to uh, stay to three minutes. I will not cut you off mid-sentence. Uh, and if you would just state your name and where you live, your city of residence, for the record, that, uh, that will make a clear record for us. Uh, so first speaker, Linda Stites, and then uh, Madeline Letchford. Well, you're not, Ms. Good evening, Stites. Mayor and Council. <laughs> I am uh, speaking on behalf of Linda Stites. I'm going to read what she wrote. She wasn't able to make it tonight. So uh, I'm Linda Stites. I've lived on Santa Clara Avenue in the Lantern District for three years. Prior to that, I owned a home in San Juan for 15. 
San Juan has its share of crime and the occasional homeless person wandering around, but nothing compared to the rampant homelessness, open drug use, beggars, and crime that I've experienced and heard about firsthand in Dana Point and Capo Beach. A lot of crime doesn't even get reported because people feel nothing is done about it. Parts of the city remind me of Skid Row in LA that I've been to. Four months ago, my car window was smashed in front of my apartment and items were stolen. Three weeks ago, my padlock garage was broken into with my surfboards and other items taken. Speaking with neighbors and strangers who live in the area, they all have similar stories. I'm going to move out of Dana Point because I'm tired of the drugged out and sometimes verbally abusive homeless sleeping around my building and at the vacant Montessori school across from my garage. They're on the streets and begging in front of the restaurants and businesses. The area around Costco and uh, the thrift shop out of Africa looks like a third world country with the loiters, trash, and people lying in front of businesses. I've literally seen a guy defecating during the day behind one of the buildings there when I drove by. The open space next to the U-Haul rental and the on-ramp there has an encampment with a barbecue someone is using to cook with. Not too smart in the, with the leaves under the eucalyptus trees. That's a fire disaster waiting to happen. There are also makeshift shelters along the river and under the overpass that have been there for weeks that no police or authority has cleared out. Why is this allowed to go on here when the crime and eyesores affect our quality of life, businesses, insurance rates, home values, and safety? I don't understand why it's okay to turn a blind eye to these problems when other cities seem to have it more under control and take action quickly. Is the police department complacent? Do we want San Juan Creek to turn into another Santa Ana River situation? Visitors also find it alarming and disappointing. I feel the city has taken an attitude that Dana Point and Capo Beach are sanctuary cities for the worst our society has to offer instead of the best. The feeding of the homeless on the beaches is just encouraging, enabling them to stay in the area, compounding the problem instead of allowing them to go to the rescue mission and other government run programs where they can get long term help. I hope the police department, mayor, and city council will take immediate action to fix these serious problems so that our city does not turn into a Santa Monica or Venice ruining our beautiful town. Thank you. Well, thank you, although I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, Madeline Letchford? Hi. Hi, good evening. Good evening, I'm, I'm Madeline Letchford from Capistrano Beach. Good evening, council members. After many complaints about the large transient camp on PCH near Doheny Village, I was thrilled to see it cleaned up yesterday morning. However, it took less than 24 hours for a full setup to reemerge. This is about one example of a growing problem that the Dana Point City Council really needs to face head on. At the last council meeting, transient campsites were a critical topic that did not receive its fair share of focus. An eight minute cut of the fireworks in Easter Egg County outshadowed public safety and the enforcement of codes designed to keep citizens safe. Council, you should be unified and voting together on two topics, public safety and crime prevention. Laws have changed, but I do not know of any laws that restrict crime prevention or resolving community issues before they become blotter worthy. The Homeless Task Force and other specialty groups have skills and training to handle special circumstances proactively. Anaheim's transients are now on the move. I wonder how many have already relocated south, <coughs> excuse me, or are headed towards a Lux Beach lifestyle. CBS featured a transient who was angry since he had only been on the riverbed a month. A month of living and trashing Anaheim. He collected more garbage, garbage in his tent than I put out for a family of five in the last month. That is disgusting and unsanitary. When transients live with their own waste and trash to their encampments, we are all living with it too. Transients are not regular residents of this town as they were referred to in the last council meeting and making decisions around them is a slippery slope. Dana Point is in fact a real home to thousands of people who work diligently and relentlessly to provide a legitimate residence for themselves. The cost of living here is significant. Homeowners and renters deserve and expect to live in a community that is clean and safe and not have to complain and beg to receive that from our city. My daughters, 11 and eight, they're in the hallway. They were at Pines Park on Sunday where some kids found a campsite. My daughter called home to let me know that some boys were going towards it, I'm sorry, it's kind of an upsetting. Uh, oh, please. And I advised my girls to move on. Our neighborhood kids are approaching these encampments out of curiosity 
because they're literally on top of our homes now in the parks that are inside of our neighborhoods. Later that day, while riding the trolley with my family to the concert in the park, the tents next to Do Doheny Beach were visible. The Marriott guests on the trolley were very surprised as strung out men came and went from the bushes so close to the beachgoers in their hotel. It was sad and embarrassing. Doheny is a landmark beach. It's where so many teach their kids to paddle for waves and appreciate and love our delicate relationship with the ocean. Is it now also an up and coming tent city? How will the impact of trash, waste, and drug paraphernalia affect our beach and the water quality in the future? Is this all unimportant considerations? Fire potential, toxic materials, and dangerous concoctions are all typical items found at these sites. This is a more serious code violation than someone who is using the wrong screws for his deck. Code enforcement and this council need to prioritize and act accordingly. I was heartbroken for the man who spoke at the last council meeting about coming back to the U.S. after living abroad with his family and how he felt like he made a mistake because transients have taken over the bluff at his home and how he can no longer allow his kids to play alone in the backyard. For all the sacrifices that have been made to make the United States a location to thrive, young families like his and mine don't feel safety is prioritized in Dana Point. We need more and more proactive action, more actionable ordinances, and more enforcement on these problems. Thank you. Would you like? Oh, no, I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lauren Hanna, and then Carol Wilson. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lauren Hanna. I'm from Irvine, and I'm an intern at Alzheimer's Orange County. I'm here to invite you to the 2017 Walk for Alzheimer's. Since 1982, Alzheimer's Orange County has been the county's largest local nonprofit organization dedicated to providing free education, support, and advocacy to people and families living with memory loss. We're here to provide direct care and services to families who need us. The Walk for Alls is the largest community event to raise awareness and funds for this effort. Each year, 10,000 people participate in our Walk for Alls, uniting the entire community in the fight against <coughs> dementia. This fall, the Walk for Alzheimer's is coming back on October 14th in Laguna Niguel at the Regional Park. There's no fee to register, and we invite people to participate in fundraising to support this local walk. The Walk for Alls is the only Alzheimer's walk in this county where 100% of the funds raised remain local. These funds support programs, advocacy, <coughs> research, and support services for all people struggling with dementia. As this county's third leading cause of death, more than 84,000 people in Orange County are currently living with dementia, a number that's expected to triple by 2025. Now more than ever, we need your help and support. Please take the first step toward a dementia-free community by participating in a Walk for Alls. Get registered by visiting www.alzoc forward slash walk or by calling our free 24-hour helpline. It's 1-844-HELP-ALZ. That's 844-435-7257. Please join Alzheimer's Orange County as we provide care and support until there's a cure. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Carol Wilson from uh, Capistrano Beach section of Dana Point. July 4th seems like a long time ago. However, in my neighborhood this year was the absolute worst illegal fireworks in the history of my 40 years there. It was literally like a war zone with M80s going off from early evening till 1 a.m. I know the sheriff's department was called. I can see that they visited some of the locations from the sheriff's log. However, after the visits by the sheriff's department, the offenders continued to fire off illegal fireworks late into the night. I understand with the huge crowds that Dana Point gets at the harbor for July 4th that most of our resources are deployed there, working traffic, crowd control, and other duties. That doesn't leave much to enforce the city ordinance of no fireworks for those of us living in the neighborhoods. We need to come up with some new ideas for next year. So here are a couple of mine. Get our VIPS to do a roaming patrol, not to confront offenders, but to serve as witnesses and direct whatever officers are on neighborhood duty to the violator's location. Dana Point should be able to set any amount as a fine for setting off illegal fireworks. I suggest these fines be hefty and on second call double or triple in amount. We are looking for more revenue in the city. What better way than finding those people who are violating codes with large fines? What other resources could help with this? Are there police cadets 
or perhaps someone from Camp Pendleton that could do volunteer work that evening for us, not to be enforcement, but just to be eyes and ears. Personally, I have called on illegal fireworks near my home in prior years, and I've had the police come out, and a short time later, the neighbors continued to set off the fireworks. Even though I called again to report it, the neighbors didn't stop until they ran out. Not only is this frightening to pets, those with PTSD, on a weeknight going well into the night caused issues for those people who had to get up early and go to work the next day. As a city, we're smart enough to come up with a better way to handle this next year. Thank you. Thank you. Lynn Smith and then uh, William Joseph Green. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, you my give pleasure. numerous opportunities during the council meeting. That's very great. My name is Lynn Smith. I've lived in Capistrano Beach since 71. Could speak just a little louder, please, into um, the microphone. It was fitting for the pastor to speak first. In a world of discord, whose prayers for wisdom, peace, listening to others, and admitting when wrong seem like good words to really consider. Of course, I could not say it better. I have read in local paper and witnessed at council meetings discord that is disappointing. New ideas should be welcomed, considering the financial challenges we face. Cutting budget items instead of waiting for possible development options seems prudent. Possible staff overloads in some events that has seen dwindling audiences every year, such as a bicycle Grand Prix, need to be followed closer. Assistance to the Dana Point Symphony seemed like a good investment for keeping a strong cultural presence. Last week when budget items were on the agenda, there was a huge crowd who needed to speak. Doing a big presentation on the state of development in Dana Point did not really change my mind in the line items that, um, at hand. I do not think it served the public who had to wait too many hours to speak. Counting on development to occur in the future instead of budgeting in the present does not seem logical. One can, use, uh, one can choose to spend one's own bankroll any way one chooses, but not paying attention to overspending of the citizens of Dana Point's bankroll is not physically responsible. I hope to see less contention in the staff and more creative thinking than existed in the past. I'm hoping to see that, spreadies, and also spreading dollars equally to all districts with the entire city, and thoughtfully cutting back in all areas of our budget. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Green, welcome. Um, I'm really not prepared for this, but I don't really have any choice but to come today because I don't know what else to do. Okay, if you could and just state your name, please, your name and My name is William live. Green. And where you live. And I'm here to speak on, uh, be here, be, I should have a prepared statement, but I, That's okay. I can't do don't that. That's okay, don't worry about it, don't worry. Anyways, um, I don't know how to say this within three minutes, but um, I've been homeless a long time. And uh, if it wasn't for this sign holding, I would have nothing. I would have no money, I would not have no clothes, nothing. And, and I thank the people of this county, this town and the county for their support, because without it, I don't know what to do. And I'm, I'm at the end of my wits, I don't know what to do. I should be. I should be in a wood shop making doors and custom doors like I did. I built the radius windows at the Ritz Carlton. But uh, now I just, I'm down to this. Anyways, I, uh, I asked the Lord to, uh, to uh, help me with this problem, this homeless problem. And I said, I think after all the, the time I've been homeless, tents and all that stupid stuff, it doesn't work. Um, this housing thing isn't working either. And uh, I asked St. Rita to help me with the problem since she's the impossible dream saint, and she uh, gave me a few knowledge what to do. And people like Chrissy, you don't know what to do about Chrissy. She's crying and screaming down there. I know what to do about that. And, and it's what uh, St. Rita told me to do. She said, you need to get a big piece of property. And she said, actually, we chose you because you'd been there. But the piece of property that she wants me is in Carbon Canyon, and I just don't see it happening, because this is supposed to go worldwide. She said, this will go worldwide, but you need to hurry, because the fate of the homeless is, is not good. 
they're going to put us in FEMA camps and exterminate us. But <clears throat> anyways, it's a piece of property. Everybody has their own little gypsy wagon. They go in there, they lock their stuff, and, and then you can go out and look for work. And actually, we could put a little shop there. I could uh, run the shop. I've had my own business before. And uh, I could teach these people how to get back into productive citizens. And basically, um, that's about it. Uh, OK. Well, Mr. Denny? I mean, there's, there's more. I, I just, I'm unprepared, you know? That's OK. Don't worry about it. That's OK. You were, you were good. You were very good. I appreciate but, uh, that you came. If we had a piece of property and we each had little gypsy wagons, I could build them. I could have shops build them that are Christians, you know, they will be glad to help. And, and we could end this problem. We can end this homeless problem. And, and okay. Well, if you could stay here for a minute, we may be able to put you, connect you with people who can help. I'll be glad to. If you would like to sit. Thank you. Uh, last speaker, Tony Nelson. Good evening. My name is Tony Nelson, Capistrano Beach. Um, in the past few months, Capo Cares has received a growing number of complaints about graffiti, transient encampments, litter, petty thefts, mail thefts, a lot of mail thefts, and other nuisances. Just today, I noticed two walls of graffiti next to the Seaside Inn, and there was a similar display near the Doubletree Hotel this weekend. It was completely covered with graffiti. Uh, last week, I met with a group of Doheny Village business owners who were understandably concerned about the transients, litter, and unsanitary, unsanitary conditions around their businesses. And I believe, like Doheny Village, there are other hot spots in the city that receive an unusual number of calls for police services. While much of this is explained by AB 109 and Props 47 and 57, we know they have an impact, there is still a growing perception that our quality of life and sense of safety are being adversely affected in Dana Point. In response to a public records request, I just received OCSD's crime statistics for the first six months of 2017, which I'll pass on to the city clerk. Um, Dana Point is by no means a dangerous city. Uh, we actually have a pretty safe city in many, many, almost every respect. But some of this data is changing and it's worth noting. Uh, while total part one offenses actually declined by 4%, it went from 298 crimes to 312 for the first six months of 2017, um, there was a 68% increase in residential burglaries. And that kind of makes us nervous. Uh, 19 of these 37 burglaries involved forcible or attempted forcible entry. So it's not just people leaving their doors open. That was a concern before. Uh, part two offenses, are, unfortunately, are up 26% over the six-month period last year, from 415 to 525 crimes in the six months. Most notably, vandalism, like what I saw at the Seaside Inn, is up 35%, and narcotics violations are up a hefty 88%. 124 this year versus 66 for the first six months of 2016. So that's kind of concerning. As Chief Chilton will warn, understandably, it's hard to draw any major conclusions from this data. Uh, but there are a few things that there that I think should alert council that some of these trends might be going in the wrong direction and maybe it's time to take a look. I urge you to consider some of the following suggestions to get ahead of these trends before they progress further. In particular, it might be possible to hold regular homeless task force meetings. I think we've had maybe one this year, I'm not sure. Uh, two, consider a single serve liquor ban. That's been in discussion for a long time, but we haven't done it. Monitor crime formally and regularly at council meetings. Uh, direct staff and city uh, and police personnel to work with our business owners and residents and find practical solutions in those hot spots. Better lighting, street cleaning, more obvious police presence. Uh, consider forming a public safety task force like the one just form, formed in San Clemente as recommended by Matrix Consulting. They're very happy with that. And work with other cities, the county and state forks, parks to find some real solutions to aid homeless people like this poor gentleman. 
uh, in a lasting way, not just a band-aid, but in a lasting way. Uh, Dana Point is a safe, beautiful city, and it will stay that way if council, city staff, businesses, and residents work together to face our challenges head on. Let's just face it and work on it. Thank you. Thank you. And as to the uh, graffiti that you were talking about, Ms. Nelson, that has been given to uh, Mr. Killebrew and Mr. Denny, and I understand that they are working on that. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. And if I could go ahead and, I was saving this for city manager comments at the end of the meeting, but I'll go ahead and I think it's relevant given the number of speakers uh, that have brought up this issue. Next week, our chief is going to be hosting a meeting with uh, uh, four of our pastors from town here, uh, from the largest congregations, along with Susan Price, who's the county's director of care coordination, uh, an expert on homelessness. She had a lot of years of experience also in the city of Long Beach. Regarding issues of homelessness and homeless services in the city, uh, following that meeting, Ms. Price will be our featured presenter at the city's homeless task force meeting, uh, which is scheduled to be here at City Hall at one o'clock on Wednesday the 26th. And uh, just to note that meeting is open to the public. Great, thank you very much. Look forward to hearing the report on that. Uh, that is all the public comments that I have. Are there any more? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. With that, I will close the public um, comment portion of the meeting. Anybody who would like to stay and hear the rest is welcome to stay. Okay, we are on to item 10, uh, weed abatement, administrative citation program. Uh, recommended action is that the city council uh, conduct a hearing on weed abatement, cost report, and delinquent administration citation fees, and thereafter adopt a resolution confirming the cost report and delinquent citation fees and providing for collection on the uh, regular tax bill. So do we have a staff report on that, Mr. Killebrew? Yes, and I'll, Mark, will, Mark Sutton will be here, our building official, to answer any questions. But just really uh, briefly, this is the third and final action in this series of actions that started several months ago by the council, uh, where you asked us to uh, go out and uh, notice the properties. Uh, we held hearings. We gave property owners an opportunity to uh, contest our findings that uh, they've got issues that needed to be cl cleared. For those that didn't address their issues, the city contracted and sent, sent folks out to actually clear the properties. We accumulate the bills um, associated with those efforts, and that's before you now is to take the action to actually assess those uh, costs onto the property owners. Great. Thank you very much. Madam Mayor, if I yes. may add, just because this has been a question that's come up in some of the code enforcement meetings that we've had, we do have an administrative citation process as well, um, separate from the weed abatement. And people have asked, well, do you ever collect on those citations that you issue? So you'll know in that cost report that there are those costs associated with the weed abatement, but there is a second group of properties, and those are citations that have been issued where the property owners haven't paid. So those are being levied on the property as well. So yes, in fact, we do collect on those. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from uh, Council? Yes, Mr. Tomlinson. Yes. Um, I recall the list was quite large when we first started on this several months ago. So congratulations on getting many property owners to, to abate their weeds. That's a pretty small list at this point. So good job, guys. Yes, we'll second that. Okay, so um, all right, do I have a motion to, uh, well, I guess I conduct a hearing, right? Okay, so uh, we've got the report. Any questions on the report? Madam Clerk? I have no public comments. Okay. All right, so item 10. So we've had the staff report. We've had the weed abatement report. Is there anything more that we're required to do before our motion? Close the public hearing. Okay. So with that, do I uh, have a motion to uh, approve the report and confirm the cost report and delinquent citation fines? Second? Second, Madam Mayor. Any discussion? Vote? Motion carries 5-0. Um, we are on to the next item. I would like to uh, take a short recess to just allow Mr. Denny to uh, come back in before we
discuss the next item. So just a couple minutes. Thank you, thank you very much for that break. Um, and thank you, Mr. Denny, appreciate you taking care of that. Okay, now we are on to item 11, approval of city manager employment contract. Uh, and the recommended action is that the city council approve an employment contract for the uh, city manager. So do I have a staff report? You have before you uh, the actual agreement now for consideration uh, for the benefit of the public. There's copies of this on the table outside if you're interested in seeing it. Um, the uh, agreement is a four-year agreement um, with uh, kind of typical uh, terms in it that relate to an employment contract. Uh, key provisions are 
Uh, as I mentioned, the term, which is four years, uh, salary is uh, $225,000 per year. Um, and uh, to me, those are kind of the key provisions. If uh, you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you. And uh, any questions by uh, council? So we are on to the uh, a related item, the approval of the actual contract. Is that correct? Right. That's the item that's before you at this time. Okay. And do we have any public comments on that? Not on that item. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any staff report? Uh, nothing other than what I provided. Okay. So um, do we have a motion to approve the contract? And a second? I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Okay. Discussion? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, so, I want to respond in two ways uh, from the closed session report and this to uh, tie that together. Uh, in the uh, as uh, as our city attorney has reported, uh, the um, offer was made uh, approval uh, on a three-two vote. Uh, and I was one of the people who uh, voted for a different person in that in, in that uh, position. Um, the uh, so having said that and looking at it, as we went through, we had a number of candidates available, and we had a uh, a job description that we posted to the public. Um, the I thought we had several candidates who completely fulfilled the requirements in the job description. Uh, and uh, one of those most key ones was the number of years as a city manager. Um, so I felt we had better candidates than Mr. Denny to make the offer to. Um, I also thought the, uh, you know, it was a closed session uh, agreement and the uh, overall process was a little uh, concerning. But having said all of that, uh, I've worked with Mr. Denny on a, a number of items uh, up to date with very positive results. Uh, and uh, I will do 110% possible to make sure that he's a, a successful, wildly successful if I can, uh, and back him up now that the decision's made. So um, I don't want the, uh, I don't want him to come into office feeling that because I voted against him when we were voting for who to bring in, uh, that I won't do, all, that I won't give 110% to make sure that now that the decisions have been made, I back the decision, it's passed, we will move on, and everything that I can do to make him successful, I will do. So I wanted to uh, get the chance to say that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I too would like to talk to my vote. And I have a statement here that I'd, I'd like to read so that I make sure I get this right. It's very important. Because over the past few weeks, I have given a great deal of thought to what I want to say to you here tonight. And before Mr. Denny accepted the position, he and I spoke at length about what I'm going to express here tonight. So he is aware of the basis for my objections, and he will not be surprised or blindsided by my comments. But in the interest of transparency, I feel an obligation to speak on the matter and explain my no vote for the city manager position. In November of 2016, the city was required to hire a new city manager, as we all know. And the city promised the residents that it would follow a particular process to find and hire a new city manager. The previous council hired a national search firm, Bob Murray and Associates, and signed a contract with Bob Murray and Associates, agreeing to pay up to $24,000 for those services. The contract is public record, so I, I'm not saying anything out of school. The new, the new council, being us, spent several weeks giving input and ultimately agreed to a written job description with qualifications and that job description was published. A statewide search was done to find candidates. The advertised deadline for the application was March 17, 2017. The deadline was published and it was made known to all potential applicants. 
Upon receipt of the applications, the council and the recruiters settled on a specific process to separate qualified candidates from those who would not be considered, a process to vet the candidates, and a method that the council was going to use to choose among those candidates. Unfortunately, those agreed upon rules for the hiring process were completely disregarded, even in the face of strong objection. In addition, I learned from someone outside the council that the agreed upon vetting process had been bypassed. I can share that with you since the incident was observed outside of closed session. And in fact, at one meeting I became so angry with the process that I actually left the meeting. And I understand that it continued for about an hour after I walked out. It is my impression, being privy to the process and the debates in closed session, that a candidate from the outside was not likely to be hired. It is also my impression that consensus was not the goal. I firmly believe that the integrity of the process and the council's decision-making process must be trustworthy, particularly in this event because it's behind closed doors. Having told you why I voted no, I want it to be clear now that I have absolutely no reason to believe that Mr. Denny was a part of or associated with any of the actions that I have described. In fact, I have been working with him now for several weeks, and I find him to have been nothing but responsive. He interacts with me. I feel that he listens to me. He is open to ideas, and I'm very optimistic about working with him. Um, although I objected to the way the decision was made, I do respect the process. Three people voted, and that is the vote of this council. And I will respect that, and I will work with each member of this council to go forward and do the best we can for this city. And I will work and do everything possible to make Mr. Denny's tenure here a success. And I look forward to it being a success, and I have every reason to believe that it will be. Um, I, ass I assure you that I do intend to work very closely with Mr. Denny and do everything that I can, everything possible, to make him a success. Our city has some very serious issues, and for the city to succeed, Mr. Denny has, has to succeed, and I will do everything in my power to make that happen. Thank you. Does anybody else have anything to say? Any other comments? Okay, with that, um, do we have a vote uh, on, well, we have no, uh, we have a motion and a second, so let's vote on the contract. Contract is approved, 5-0. Congratulations, Mr. Denny. May we congratulate you, stand up. Okay, moving along. Item 12, Doheny Village Plan Update. Uh, recommended action is that the City Council receive and file the report, authorize and direct our City Manager to execute an amendment to the contract by and between the City and Opticos design to extend the term to June 30th, 2018, but no additional funds are being requested. Uh, do I have a motion to well, I guess we need the report, don't we? Uh, Director of Community Development, uh, Ursula Luna Renessa has got a staff report for you. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. This will truly be brief this evening. Uh, at the last update, I mentioned that tonight was the night where Dr. Wilson was going to present his recommendations in the form of the parking report. Unfortunately, we were unaware that he had a scheduled vacation, so he was not able to be present this evening. So at the next City Council meeting, he will come with that item. Um, there's a few updates regarding the environmental process, just that the consultants are continuing on. Um, and with that, there is um, the term with Opticos expired at the end of June. We are asking for a one-year extension of the term, no additional funds. Um, and part of that is just some of the delays relative to new information that's been requested. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any questions of staff? Okay. Um, I yes, Mr. Uh, so Mayor Pro Tem. And and what are the what are the implications, both of extending it and not extending it? I guess so. Why why what would happen if we chose not to extend the contract? If you chose not to extend the contract, um, we would no longer have Opticos um, available to um, assist us in completing the, the code that is um, close to being complete, but their scope included that they would assist us through the hearing process, and um, I anticipate that we would need those services from them to get through that process. And if it turned out that we didn't extend this contract and decided at some point that we wanted to use their services again, then I guess it's just a new contract, right? I suppose, um, and I have to go back and look um, at the documents regarding kind of ownership of the existing documents to date. Um, I think that we very strongly feel like we'd like to keep Octocos engaged, they, they have a lot of other clients as well, so in the event that they think we're terminating this, they're moving on, they're picking up other clients, it might not be so easy to re-engage them in a timely manner. I also have a question, if we sign this contract and extend it, are we obligating ourselves to do anything under this contract? No, we always have the option to terminate the contract. Okay. Any other questions? Questions? Okay, so uh, I guess the first item is to receive and file the report. Do I have a motion to do that? So moved. Second? Discussion? Vote. Okay, so the report will be filed and received. Uh, second item is to authorize and direct the city manager to execute the amendment of the contract with Opticos and the city to extend the term to June 30th, 2018, no additional funds being requested and no additional, and actually no obligation under the contract to take any action until we authorize further action. Is that correct? Correct, yes. Uh, motion? Madam Mayor, I'll move that motion. Second. Somebody? Second. Thank you. Okay, uh, any discussion? Vote? We're just waiting on our electronics. Ah, there we go. Okay, so the contract will be extended. No funds and no obligation on our part. I do have a question. Uh, do I direct this to you, Mr. Denny? Because I would like to direct staff, instead of having a Doheny Village update, that we combine all of the, all of the development that's going on in the city, including Doheny, and hear that report, uh, well, I think we should have that monthly. I know we talked about that last time, that we wanted a general development update. And I'd like to do that all together. We're all, it's all part of Dana Point. I think we should hear it all together. Um, you can put in for public speaking, but I can't take questions from the, sorry, but you can put in something for public speaking. So um, I would like to, uh, Okay, so you want to talk on this specific item? Oh, yeah, just come up, fill in, come up, talk to us, and then uh, if you would fill one of those out. Okay. Oh, okay. Great, thanks. Okay, my, my fault, sorry. Um, okay, uh, Teresa Bauer? Okay, sorry. I didn't see the accent. <laughs> Hi, council members. I am Teresa Beauvais, and I'm a resident of Dana Point. I'm here um, in opposition to what we have planned for the Doheny Village. Um, I understand you guys signed the contract, and we're going to continue on. I do have a question and concern about whether or not they're going to do additional services for 
he says no additional funds at this being requested, maybe at this point, but if they do additional work, is that gonna cost us money? We've already spent, what, $900,000 on this? I would not be in favor of spending any more money on this because we have very little to show for what we spent so far. Um, I am concerned. What I would suggest is though, is that it seems that people think that everybody knows about what's going on in Doheny Village. I disagree. I've talked to people, I've lived here since 1986. They don't know what's going on. I understand there's charrettes. I've been to the charrettes. Other people have been to charrettes. And I've talked to many of the business owners that are down there. They're not in favor of this. What I would suggest is you have a meeting with Optico and open it up to everybody and all the owners and property owners and everybody get properly notified of that meeting. And we can go in there and ask all the questions that we want instead of them trying to show us the design of what they would want our property to be. And so that would be my suggestion. If we continue on with Optico for another year, which it seems like we just did, um, is that we have that meeting down at Calvary Chapel again and not have it be where it's there showing us what we need, but what we can ask. Just stand there and ask some questions to see what's going to happen to our properties down there and the businesses. And I don't think that's asking too much of the city. Because it seems like to me that the city is forcing us to do something that we don't want. But according to the city, they're saying, this is for your good. Well, I'm sorry, but I thought we are this land of the free. And, and, and we want to encourage businesses. And it doesn't appear to me that's what's happening. It sounds like to me the government is trying to force something on us that we don't want. So those are my suggestions. And I'm also concerned because I see in the, your closed session that you had attorney's fees. Why is that? Because I think of what you're doing down there here at Doheny Village for one thing. Now we're all in favor, I'm sorry, we're in favor of cleaning up, get rid of the homeless and all of that and more lighting and landscaping and all that. But as far as changing the form base, we are against form based coding for down there. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I wanted to ask a question of staff that um, any, any more money spent on this comes back to council. That's my understanding, correct? Um, well, we have an environmental consultant firm that's been contracted. Their scope of work's been awarded. They are working away. So as they work, they will submit invoices to us that we will pay. Um, Opticos right now, there hasn't been anything for them to do. We're not expecting any invoices, so specifically for them, yes, we would be directing them to do something like attend a meeting or wh whatever. Um, but there are the environmental um, impact analysis, the uh, EIR is being prepared, and we are receiving invoices for that work. And that was already approved, though, quite correct. a while back, correct? Right, but I mean, Opticos's contract has been approved as well. The total amount, we haven't spent all of that money. Right. And to, to do anything more on that contract, you have to bring that, you will bring that back to well, us, correct? We technically wouldn't have to, but yes, we um, will wait for direction. Let me clarify, we haven't spent all the money on all the tasks that have been, are in that contract. What happened when you, when you adopt a contract or approve a contract, it's got a dollar cap that we can't exceed, but it's also got a time limit. What's happened is we've hit the end of the time limit, so we're asking for more right. time, but there's still, um, still tasks and money in the contract. We're just okay. asking to extend the time. Okay, so, so I would Anything like beyond what's already in that contract, any additional scope, we would have to come back to council. Okay, so, and that's what I would like to direct staff. Before we do anything on that contract, yeah, I'll let you talk. Before we do anything on that contract, that it come back to council. I mean, I, I voted for it because I asked if we were obligated to do anything and if we were spending any money and on the basis that if we, if, we go forward with this, which I'm not sure we will or we won't, that we have the contract. But I, my understanding is that anything more will be brought back to us first, correct? Well, I would like to direct staff. May I speak on this issue? We still have a couple uh, more public comments. I, I still have more public comments, but I, I have a question. Can I, I want to respond to this. Well, yeah, you'll, you'll have your time. You'll, you'll have your time. Let me, let me finish here. Just have to finish here. And we're not done. We're not. We're not done with the public comment. We will let you speak. I'm asking some questions. So your turn is next. Okay, promise you. Um, okay. So uh, 
Did you have something to say, Mr. So I, I um, well, two things. I just want to be clear. Um, to hold a, a public meeting uh, at Capo Beach Church or wherever to go over this does not require that Opticos be a part of that meeting. Is that correct? That is, we're not tied to their schedule or committed in any way to part to have them participate. Is that correct? Correct. Staff could host a meeting, or we, that was just a suggestion, and I was just using that as an example. Right. right. I know. I'm, I'm actually responding to the comments because I, I, I wouldn't, one, I wouldn't uh, hold it up or pay the money for them to come. We've had them in the meetings in the past. They have an agenda, right? I mean, that's what they do. Um, and they will, I mean, they've sort of dominated the meetings from time to time, and we need more input from others. Um, I've told you this, but I'm not surprised. I'm not a big fan of form-based codes or the plan. Uh, and the reason I asked about the contract earlier was we have a lot of work to do to get it right before we finish the work. And, I, and so if, the con if extending the contract doesn't actually um, cost us or obligate us to do anything, I'm comfortable with it while we're working out really what we need to do there and getting it right. But I don't want to spend the money that's in the contract in, uh, until we know that it's useful to us. Uh, so I, I, I think it's clear that we uh, should not ask them to do additional things without approval of the council just because we've allowed the contract to not elapse from time. So I think just to be very clear for everyone, the whole contract amount was approved by the city council, and I don't recall the exact amount, but let's say it was $300,000, and let's say we've spent $200,000. We have $100,000 remaining. Technically, you've already authorized and encumbered that money, and to go above the $300,000, we are obligated to come back to the city council. We're not obligated under that. You've already approved that contract. However, if there are three of you that direct vote and direct us to stop encumbering, stop spending money on the contract, I think that would be the clearest way to understand what the desire of at least two of you are voicing. Right, so I would say here that, uh, I mean, first of all, had you said that it gave you the, the, it gave you the right to spend the rest of the money without coming back to us if we extended it, I would have not voted to extend the contract. Uh, having done that, I would put a motion on that we direct that we ask. Go ahead. Can, can we hear the rest of the public comments before we, we get in and move in discussions? And well, I can. Well, we we can. But uh, Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Okay. Well, let's okay. let's finish with the public comment, and then we'll okay. come back. Okay. Fine. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Doug Lowe, Thank you. and then Maria. Maria uh, Mancuro. Hi. Sorry, you know, we weren't, we weren't trying to deprive you of your time, but sometimes we have to do some business up here, but we will definitely get everybody who wants to speak a chance to speak. I promise you. Okay. I'm, I'm just maybe a little confused on a point of order. I'll get to that point in a minute. To uh, your to name and where you live. As an introduction of myself, I have yes. three minutes. My name is Doug Lowe. I go by that. My full name is Douglas Allen Lowe. Okay. I was born in 1953. Okay. The year this business, or this business, the city was incorporated, I'd been in, on that property operating my business for 12 years prior to the city being a city. Now, I have some ideas on what I would like to do on my property. And I appreciate very much the city of Dana Point spending almost a million dollars, or committing to spend a million dollars to get it right. I really do appreciate that. The wisdom of the city council, I thought it was a lot of money back then, but you know, it's a tough project. It's a difficult thing to decide what to do in an area that should be planned for 250 years from now. The building I'm in is over 100 years old, and it was built just from pieces of wood and some concrete pilasters. And it's 100 years old. It's still being used. They're, they're tearing down, down builder, buildings that are newer than that one because they, they don't fit the need. I, I want to design a building that is uh, flexible, that can adapt to new things in the next 250 years. 
I want it to be sustainable on the arising water table, so it's going to have to float. I want to put a helicopter pad on top so that we can, in the, me in the event of a, a real emergency, we can have an, a triage right there. We, if we set it up so we can load furniture or tools or things from the air, we can take all the tools out, put in medical devices, and make it a, make it a triage center in a, in a short period of time. So what I'm thinking of is the uh, three lots, inclu including Chick's Plumbing. Actually, there's four lots there. Feed Barn is on two lots. And I'm between the Feed Barn and uh, Chick's Plumbing. So what I'm trying to say is I have a team of engineers. I have an architect. I have the funding, and I just have not had the time to put any proposals for the city. So what I'm asking is the city delay any further expenditures with this firm because I'd like to be able to present uh, a design idea in the next 60 to 90 days. Would that be fair enough of a request for the city council to just agree to uh, uh, put the contract with the uh, design firm on hold for 60 days. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I think that you will, you will hear, because we are still talking about this contract. We're not done with it yet. So by the end of this, I your, thank you for, your thank question. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate all your hard work that you do here. It's a very long schedule for all of you, I know, and I really do appreciate it. Um, I just, but on the and I'm a point, is the point of order is I thought I had a chance to talk before you voted on, on the issue. I may be mistaken. Maybe you didn't vote on it. On we the haven't agenda. voted on it yet. My mistake. I apologize. Yeah. And I'll leave you. We only voted to file and receive the report. Okay. We, we voted on the contract, but now we're about I, to determine. I, I have a pretty good team of attorneys, too, for things I don't understand. So I'm sure it will all work out. Thank you very okay. much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Did you want to say something? I wanted to thank you that we do appreciate the public comments. They take a little time and we listen to things, but we learn a lot of things and get a lot of input from the public here. So I, never, I just I could never feel bad about taking bit. our time. That's what, why, why we're here. I want to yeah. delay and that's all I asked for. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. If, if I may, Madam Mayor, I have something to add that I think could be helpful. Um, the parking study that's coming forward, the parking report, um, I think that's where staff was going to be looking for the city council for some more definitive direction. There would be no expenditures necessary by Opticos before that time because a critical piece of moving forward was the, the parking requirements for Doheny Village. And while it became a citywide discussion, there was still some focus on Doheny Village. And um, so when that comes before you at the next meeting or to meet, you know, the next meeting of the city council, um, that was where staff was looking for some direction because if this process is going to move forward, there are some significant staff resources that need to start being dedicated to moving that. As of right now, the EIR is on schedule to be ready in April. Um, so that takes into account the 45-day review period for the public, the response to comments, et cetera. That's a draft schedule at this point in time. But as of right now, that's what our consultants are indicating is when they think that will be ready for certification. Um, the issue of once it, if it gets to the Planning Commission for hearing and then it gets to the City Council for hearing, it still needs to go to the Coastal Commission, which would be a significant time. So the likelihood of that code actually going into effect is two to three years away. So any property owner in the meantime that wants to submit an application, wants to invest in their property today would be under the current zoning rules that are in effect today. We would take in that application and we would process it. So there certainly is nothing hindering any property owner from doing that. And we, there's no need to delay the process because the process as it stands is two to three years before that code would even go into effect if it moves forward. Thank you. Okay, and uh, Maria Van Curo, did you speak yet? Ah, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> My Welcome, name is thank you for being patient. Oh, sure. My name is Maria Mancuso. I live in Dana Point. We own property in Doheny Village. We are against the proposed form-based code. 
It doesn't support the industrial businesses that are currently there. We as property owners want to decide how to develop our property. The proposed form-based code wants to create a dynamic, walkable neighborhood. Have any of you been down there at night? <laughs> the homeless situation needs to be addressed and the parking codes enforced before any type of development take place. The proposed traffic circle and one lane traffic in each direction would be a disaster on Dahini Park Road. Before any council member votes on Doheny Village rezoning, we invite you to come spend time with us at night and see firsthand what goes on in the area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I have any other? <laughs> any other public comments? No, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. Then I'm going to close the portion of the public comment. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, did you want to? Uh, yes, based on um, understanding now about um, the spending that goes along with extending, I guess, the contract, I would like that I would make a motion that we reconsider that vote to extend the contract. Because that is true. We did already vote to, to proceed with it, but I understand now in light of us not hearing the public comment that and proceeding that there may be some things that we want to modify. So what, what, what would the procedure at this point? Uh, there's a second. So let, let me explain what the procedure now. So we had a vote and um, we've learned information after the vote that would have changed members' uh, votes. So under Robert's Rules of Order, there is a motion to reconsider a vote. And only a member who has voted on the winning side is able to make that motion. So. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, who voted for and it passed, has the ability to make a motion to reconsider the vote. That needs a second, we can debate it, and then we will vote on it. And that motion cannot be reconsidered. So right now on the table, we have a motion to reconsider the vote. Is there a second? I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Okay. Uh, any discussion? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Be clear, well, Are we voting on if the vote passes, then we're going to vote again, or is this the actual re-vote? What, what's the intent of the motion? This is, if, if it's adopted, the original motion is placed before the assembly, and then we vote on it again. So this is just to, to allow you to re the motion. and then we're revo re Yes, re so this is a motion to reconsider, and if it passes, then we re-vote. Okay, so we have a motion to reconsider and a second. So uh, no, no further discussion? I'd like to add a Oh, a yes, Mr. Comment Tomlinson. You know, I think it's only fair that we reconsider this because of the fact that there, we, we had kind of jumped the gun by not having public, public yes. comment on this. So yes. that's why I'm voting for this. I mean, it is to reconsider because we had not all the evidence in light in front of us. So thank you. Okay, and I want to, um, well, uh, it's already been seconded, so, but I just would like to explain that I am also reconsidering with the information now that my understanding was that it was just kind of a placeholder. We were under no obligation to do anything and we were not going to spend any more money. But hearing now that there was the ability to spend $100,000 more, I would, had I known that, I would not have agreed to this. So motion to reconsider, uh, vote on that. Okay, so the motion to reconsider is uh, passes 5-0. So now uh, we actually uh, place the motion for approval of uh, an extension to amend the contract to extend it to June 30th before the council. And is there discussion on that? Well, I guess do I have a motion? Motion to reconsider, a motion to vote on the contract. I'll move the recommended action. Okay, and then a second. I'll second. Okay, any discussion? So now we are actually once again voting uh, whether or not to amend the contract to extend the term to June 30th. So a no vote will say we're not extending it and a yes vote will say we are extending it. So do, is there any comments? Mr. Discussion, Collins? yeah. Um, you know, I kind of heard the idea floating around up here that, you know, before we expend any more monies that would come back to the city council. I, I don't have a problem with extending their contract and you know I, I've had businesses where you know we've changed an, a, a, an engineer or something midway and it's just caused a bunch of problems so 
I think maybe if you look at it a case by case basis for the remaining funds that we have already approved, that I wouldn't have a problem with it, but I would like to see us have the authority to approve those expenditures before, before we actually expend them. Okay, well, at this point, we have been told that there is no need to, that, that the $100,000 has already been approved. And it if could I could be chime in with the sure. council's uh, direction to go ahead and extend the contract and staff is committed to not move forward with additional tasks assigned to the contract without coming back to the council, um, it doesn't sound like that would be a problem. So okay, the council well would be able to discuss any task, any further work on the contract would come back to you regardless. Okay, at this point though, the, all right, so, so with that, at this point the motion on the table is still to uh, approve the amendment to the, uh, extend the term to June 20th. Did you have something? I, I have a question. Okay, okay. I, Mr. I, Miller? I have a question. And it, I'm glad you have the book out because it's got to be part of Robert's rules. Robert's rules. <laughs> um, Never go away. You just mentioned, and I wasn't aware of this, that since this is a, uh, what, what was the term I, I told it? Reconsideration motion. Yes, re we're reconsidering the book. But you said that once we, we go with a reconsidered motion, we can't change it. We can't reconsider the reconsideration. We can't reconsider We've the already reconsideration. Done that. We're now on but to the But my contract. question is, does that mean we can actually amend the motion that we're reconsidering? Yes, because now the original motion is on the table. Okay, so, so we can. it can be amended up to twice under Robert's rules. Okay, I just want to make sure, because when you said that, it kind of caught me off guard. I was okay. like, wait, can we change this or not? Yes, we can so amend. So I'm going along with Mr. Tomlinson down there, and I don't know if he actually amended the motion or not. He has not but I would like to m amend the motion that before we spend any more money on this contract, that whatever the number is, 100,000, whatever it is left over, that 13 to 15K, by the way, I just got confirmation. Is it, that's how much money's left on the contract. 13, 13 to 15 13 to 15,000 dollars? Yes. It's not 100,000 then. Okay. okay. Well, example, I mentioned I don't recall, oh, it's an example. Well, okay, you guys yes, totally changes it. threw us. <laughs> okay, all right, so um, are you moving to amend the uh, motion on the table to amend the contract and your amendment says. Yeah, I'll let Mr. Tomlinson do it. It was, he had it going on. Okay, so uh, you have a motion to amend. That we authorize and, uh, and direct the city manager to execute amendment to the contract by and between the city and Opticos to extend the term of the agreement to June 30th, 2018 with the provision that city council is given the opportunity to approve any further expenditures of funding remaining on the 13 to $15,000 on the contract. Okay, so do I have a second on the amendment? I'll second. Okay, any discussion on the amendment? Okay, so right now we're voting on the amendment. If the amendment passes, then we vote on the motion as amended. Okay, so we're now voting on the amendment as, yes? Mr. Madam Mayor, can I, I'll just accept the amendment and we can vote on it. Well, we on have the, to, I mean, that's the I rule. can accept we have the friendly to vote. amendment. We don't have to vote on the amendment. I can accept it and we can vote on the actual motion. Okay. And move forward. Well, thank you. Do we have a problem with voting on the amendment? An amended motion. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. All right. So uh, we need to vote. So everyone has accepted the amendment. So we are now voting on the amended motion to ex to extend the contract with the proviso uh, by Mr. Tomlinson. They'll have one out, guys. There it goes. <laughs> okay. So the uh, amended motion to approve the amendment to uh, extend the term with the proviso that no further money is to be spent on that contract without coming back to council for approval. That passed 5-0. Okay, item 13, city council attendance at city commission committee and board meetings. I believe this is your motion, Mr. Miller. I mean, uh, your agenda item or? Okay, so would you like to speak to it? I'll start. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the only reason I brought this up is, you know, uh, the three of us attended a financial review committee meeting all at the same time. It was not planned, it just happened to happen. I don't think any of us realized it until Mr. Munoz came out in the audience and addressed each of us. And it just kind of clicked something in my head. Is this an issue with the Brown Act? Is it not? And, and it was explained that it was not. But it, the real question was not can or can't we go to these meetings? It's really more of should or shouldn't we go? 
And I asked Mr. Munoz if we ever had a policy, and he said yes, if the Planning Commission had it and had one. And I said, well, you know, I'd like to hear why they created their policy and, and get a little bit better understanding of why that council did it and, and give me, you know, some information behind what we should or shouldn't be doing, not can or can't. We all know that, you know, our First Amendment rights protect us going to those meetings, but, uh, you know, it's a perception issue with the with the public. If you're all there, you know, are you talking? Is it really transparent at that point or not? I don't know. I just wanted to bring it up for a discussion at the dais, and, and I think I'd like to ask Mr. Munoz if he could actually discuss this policy uh, on the on the uh, planning commission, because I believe he was here, or he may have even drafted it, and, and kind of give us some background on, on why a previous council thought this this might become an issue. Uh, certainly. So if you look at supporting document A, that's the actual policy that the council has adopted relating to attendance at planning commission meetings. Um, and it, this was a discussion about, kind of reaching back to my memory, it seems like it was about 10, 10 years ago, give or take, there was some concern um, about, um, uh, count, oh, in fact it says right there, it's, uh, uh, 2005 is when it was uh, amended. So. Um, Anyway, at that time, there was some concern about what it, what it looked like when council members were showing up at, at planning commission meetings. Um, there was a big issue with planning commission meetings where you're dealing with quasi-judicial decisions um, that could be appealed to the city council. And um, if it's a quasi-judicial decision, the council, when it hears it, has to act sort of like a, like, like a court. And they have an obligation to afford people their due process rights, which just basically means fairness. You know, you're entitled to a fair hearing. Um, and if people have showed up and participated in earlier um, discussions about a project, then it raises a question of whether they're really being fair or objective. So that was a, a big concern that the council had at the time. And, and if you read the background, it kind of lays that out a little bit. Then the other concern that they had was that if individual members of the council are showing up at meetings, that it gave the impression that the individual, especially if they spoke, um, was representing the views of the entire council as opposed to, the, to themselves as individuals. And that, it, um, you know, it had a, a, an influencing sort of effect on the planning commission members. So the council was concerned about it, and as they went down this path, I think um, at that time, had given their druthers, they might have uh, gone as far as saying, well, you can't go to these other meetings. Um, but it's interesting if you read the actual policy as compared to the background, the policy simply says, um, that unless you're directed to uh, do so by a majority of the council, that members should refrain from speaking on public hearing matters being heard by the Planning Commission. So it really comes down to just kind of a question of uh, your conduct at meetings if you go to them. And, you know, I think that there was a recognition by the, um, the council that, uh, as you already alluded to, that there's a certain amount of a First Amendment right to go to meetings if you want to. Um, and the Brown Act already addresses what the rules are in terms of if council members uh, appear at meetings. Um, if, if a majority of you attend, whether it's a planning commission meeting or any other meeting, um, the Brown Act makes it very clear that that's permissible, um, as long as you don't participate. The minute you participate, then all of a sudden, if it's not properly noticed, it would be a Brown Act violation. Um, so, you know, my, my recommendation to the council is um, to the degree that you uh, choose to go to meetings um, that might be, uh, uh, whether it's the um, Planning Commission or the FRC, which is where this uh, came up from, that uh, you sit, sit separately from each other so you don't give the impression to the public that, um, that you're having conversations about the, the topic. It sort of undermines transparency, I think, if, if the public has a sort of a perception that you're engaged um, at the council level already on a matter that's before a lower board. Um, certainly do not participate by speaking at the meeting if there's a quorum present. Um, you know, you, you certainly have a right to speak if there's not a quorum present. Um, kind of raises the question of whether that's good practice or not. I think that, you know, it has potential to raise problems, um, but it's within your discretion if you uh, choose to do that or not. Um, so that's kind of the background and the thinking behind the existing policy and whether this policy I mean, this policy is clearly limited to the Planning Commission, not to all of your, your meetings. Um, you know, the Brown Act applies to all your meetings, you know, whether it's the FRC or the Planning Commission or whoever. And, you know, the, the law is very clear that you, if, you, if, if a 
quorum is present, which would be three of you, um, you cannot participate in the meeting by speaking. That would be a Brown Act violation. Did I answer your question? Well, I'd like to speak to that because the policy that we've been discussing is 205, which is uh, specifically attendance at planning commission meetings. And the policy, as Mr. Munoz said, unless specifically directed to do so, a majority of council, city council members should refrain from speaking on public hearing matters being heard by the planning commission. And that, that policy was uh, effective 2-1390 and amended 3-1197 and 11-95. But I draw your attention to policy 220, which was effective date of 1-1106. Its purpose was to establish a uniform policy regarding the attendance of city council members at subcommittee and task force meetings. So now we're talking about something other than the planning commission. And the policy is in order to allow subcommittees to operate as intended as advisory bodies to the council and to ensure they do not become forums for discussion and the formulation of a collective concurrence on issues by a quorum of the council, a council member who is not a subcommittee member and attends a meeting of a standing committee should only do so as an observer and not a participant. So I think we've already got a policy on attending subcommittees as well as Planning Commission. I, I don't have that policy in front of me at the moment, but that sounds like it applies to subcommittees of the City Council, and there's been some changes in the law since that. I, frankly, I didn't remember that policy, but based on what you just read to me, I think that we ought to be looking at that policy and considering changing it because I have some concerns uh, about uh, the, the Brown Act ramifications. If two of you are holding a meeting and a third one of you sits there and listens, pretty clear in my mind that that would be a Brown Act violation. So. Um, we, uh, we probably ought to look at that policy. Okay, so now I'm confused. Are you saying that if there's a subcommittee that, n that, that we aren't at? For example, the FRC. None of us are on that. The, the FRC is not a subcommittee. The it's FRC is a committee established by this council. A okay. subcommittee is a, a group of two of you um, okay. uh, or task force, typically we have a group of two of you um, with the idea that you can work on a project and not have to um, be constrained by the Brown Act noticing requirements and things like that. Um, and if a third person showed up at that type of a meeting, even if they weren't participating, that would be a concern to me. I, I was able to pull the policy up here, and um, I mean, I, I'll just tell you that this is a policy we ought to relook at because I would have some Brown Act concerns about it. Okay. So in terms of, of us, say I, I'm thinking the FRC because that's the one I've gone to. There's there's no problem going to it. I don't speak at it. And if more than, I don't speak to any other council member uh, about there's it. There's clearly no violation of the law if one, two, three, or five of you show up at the FRC as long as you don't participate. Okay. Um, you know, whether you want to have policies dealing with that's a different issue, but under the law, that's um, perfectly um, legal. Okay. Any other uh, questions, comments? Okay, next item, new business. Uh, number 14, award of a contract for the construction of the annual slurry seal project for fiscal year 1718. Do you have a staff report on that? We do, Mr. Denny's gonna provide a staff report. Mr. Denny? Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. On May 23rd of 2017, the city advertised for bids uh, certain work that is budgeted in your capital improvement program, inclusive of the slurry seal program, roadway rehabilitation and repairs, and sidewalk slash concrete repairs and ADA improvements. On June 27th, two proposals were received. Uh, as I mentioned, the scope of work combined three separate capital projects that are budgeted uh, by your council. The total approved budget for the work is $975,000. The total proposed project costs are $953,092. Um, I will note that we separately bid the materials testing and geotechnical work so that the uh, general contractor doesn't include that work in their bid and mark us up for that. And so we get better pricing on that. So we did get three separate bids and uh, the proposal from GMU came in the lowest uh, that's currently proposed uh, in front of you at uh, $40,000. 
Uh, I do want to thank Matt Sinecori and the staff and Public Works for uh, looking at uh, combining projects within the CIP uh, to generate savings within those bids. We did achieve that in this case by reducing a mobilization or two and getting better uh, unit pricing on this bid. So with that, we're available for any questions. Great. Any questions of staff? Do we have any public comments on this one? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. Okay, so uh, the first recommended action is that we approve the construction contract document required for the annual slurry seal project. And Mr. Denny, we've used these people before, this yes. uh, company? Yes, absolutely. And, and they have done work for the city before, and uh, we've been pleased with their work. Work is satisfactory. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Great. Um, so do I have a motion to approve? I move we approve the construction contract documents. Second. I'll second that, Madam Mayor. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, vote. Uh, motion carries 5-0. And I assume this was all in the budget, right? This was yes, budgeted it is. for, we're within our budget. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, second, uh, approve award of a contract to All American Asphalt for the construction of the annual slurry seal project. So could you tell us th the difference, Mr. Denny, between uh, the construction documents for the annual slurry sealing that we, that was item one and item two? Yes, it's the plans and specifications on which the contract is based. And so um, we tie back to those plans and specs in the contract itself. Okay, so item one was to prove the construction contract document itself and now we're approving the award of it. Yes, that's correct. Okay, any questions? Okay, motion to approve? So moved. Second? I'll second. Discussion? Vote? Motion carries 5-0, and this is part of our just slurry, slurry seal um, repair and ongoing um, Yes, it's process, our roadway right? maintenance program. Yes, correct. Okay. All right, item three, authorize additional materials inspection and testing services on an as-needed basis with GMU, and I think you just talked about GMU, geotechnical. You, we've used them before. You're happy with their work. And, and they this were is- the, They were the low bid. Okay. And this is necessary part of slurry sealing, correct? Yes. Okay. Any discussion? Yeah. Mr. I just have a quick question, Thomas? Mr. Denny. Um, so this involves sampling the materials as they're laid down or when they're being applied for okay. consistency of the slurry, the asphalt itself, the integrity. And compaction. Compaction. So that's after it's laid. And that yes, sir. So have we done it before where the same contractor that laid it did this, or is this always an outside party that they subcontract with too? To do I, the I can't testing. speak to the history, but in general, you want an outside third party oh, that, that to do was, your that materials testing. Point. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Motion to uh, authorize the additional materials. So moved. Second. I second. Vote. Motion carries five zero. And last item on this is to authorize the funding transfer. Any comments, discussion, motion? I move we authorize the transfer. Second. Second. Motion carries. Oh, and where is this uh, going to take, where are we going to slurry seal? So if you turn to page, that'd be exhibit B. So people know. Yeah, I know. It's a whole list. They don't know. Where Page are we? 12 of the agenda item. Yeah. You'll see the slurry seal streets, the rejuvenating texture seal sleet streets, and the uh, AC repair and crack seal. And is that item available if people want to see it? Is that item available to people? Oh, yeah. It's, it's oh, yeah. on the website. Um, okay. It's on, so it's anybody wants with to know the agenda materials. where we're slurry. And when we seal, we put out notices so people know Absolutely. your street's about to be slurry yeah. sealed. Okay. Great. Very good. All right. So uh, did we vote on that? We did. Oh, Stand good. Up. Couldn't remember. <laughs> It's been 30 seconds. All right, so item 15, City Council Summer Meeting Schedule. All right, I guess this came up because uh, 
I have family coming in and there was some question as to whether or not we wanted to cancel the meeting, but my feeling is uh, we're, met, we're scheduled to meet on the first and third uh, Tuesdays of every month and you know, if we were gonna cancel for everybody who has something, we might be canceling. So if anybody you know, wants to uh, make a motion to cancel, now is the time to do it, otherwise we will continue. Okay, so uh, we will be meeting on the uh, first and third Thursday in uh, hold, August. Madam Mayor, hold what? on. Um, you know, this was done for, for staff to get their vacations in. That's why we've always gone, uh, I believe that's why we've always gone dark in August, so staff can get their vacations in, is that correct? I actually. Or, or is it for council to get their vacations in? Sure. It's a combination of for everybody. Um, at this point in time, we're, we're, we, would we would have some items for those agendas, but we've scheduled all of our uh, work that we've identified that would need council action to be able to accommodate uh, what has been historically uh, you know, time off, which would be to not have the two meetings in August and the first meeting following Labor Day, um, but it's up to the council. And obviously, if something came up that we absolutely needed to have, uh, the council, we'd uh, call a special meeting if needed. So it's, all, it's up to the council. You know, I I don't have any problem doing the the, the first meeting, but you know, I'd, I'd hate to try to call a special meeting and call people back from vacations and things. I mean, is, is there a need for those meetings? We have something that that we need to schedule for that time. That's time sensitive. Well, at this point in time, we have Dr. Wilson available for the first meeting in August or the second meeting in August. So um, unless that you, you want to push that out, we'd have to check on his availability in September. But he's available on both, on both dates in the event that one meeting got canceled. I mean, I, I also would have a, an appeal of a planning commission decision that is currently scheduled for the 15th but could go on the 1st, possibly. Possibly, but there might be some complications with the first meeting. Gotcha. I, I mean, I, if we're going to take a block of time off, I think it should be a continuous block so people can get their vacations in. I, I'd hate to see us go the first, take the first off, come back for the 15th, and then that first meeting off. What, what are the implications on the appeal if, if you can't get it ready by the first August 1st? Is there a timeline so, we'll, so we would have our, to have our a code, Our code does not uh, define a timeline. Um, it's an inconvenience to the applicant. Um. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, John wants to talk. Mr. Tomlinson? Yeah. Is there a procedure whereby that if we don't have enough business for uh, a city council meeting, can we call that meeting off if all of a sudden say we get to you know, the second week of August, there's not enough material, or maybe even the first week of August, that we don't have enough material to really, you know, have a full city council meeting. Is there a process whereby we can say we don't have enough for that meeting item? I mean, really, unless you've given that direction to staff in advance to give them the discretion to make that determination, the problem is you'd have to meet to make the decision. Um, so it sort of, you know, defeats itself. Um, I, you know, I, I can tell you from my experience, you know, I've been city attorney here since 2002. Um, the month of August has been dark, um, and the first meeting in September has not occurred almost every single one of those years, and it's really never been an issue um, in terms of workload. There have been some times when we've had to meet because there was items that just needed to be attended to, and in, in those situations we've met. Um, it's it's I mean, this is a as councilmember miller pointed out this is really meant to be an opportunity for um staff and for the council to kind of plan and schedule around vacation so they don't have to worry about um knowing that there's meetings out there it's something that's worked but if you're more comfortable you know pushing forward and having the meeting that that's this council's determination um if you wanted to getting back to councilmember tomlinson's uh, comment just give this the, the city manager the discretion to say look if there's not something that really has to be dealt with on the first meeting in August cancel that meeting um, uh, but leave it up to him to make a determination working with the mayor perhaps to make that decision that's that would be perfectly appropriate um, 
I kind of like that idea, but yeah. I'll let everybody else uh, fill in that. And we can also call a special city council meeting if necessary for business. So if something comes up, that's always a possibility. Mr. Bazork, did you have something? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I know this is going to be such a long discussion. I, I just thought I checked my calendar before I came in. I thought we were just going to talk about when we were going on vacation. Uh, so I had on my calendar that we didn't have a meeting on August 1st. Was I incorrect? I thought the schedule was already set. That, and that's partially why when you asked do we need to make any motions to change things, I thought, well, no, we're, we're not meeting on the 1st. Uh, and the reason I say that is I made my vacation. I'm going out of town. I won't be here on August 1st, okay. but I will be here on the 15th. I also will not be here the day after Labor Day. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a meeting, but that's just my schedule. So I guess if it's necessary, that would be my preference to say we don't meet on August 1st and we don't meet the day after Labor Day. Other than that, I'm available to meet. Those okay. are my, that's my two cents. Thank you, Fair Madam enough. Mayor. I, I just didn't want to be the person who was... Uh, causing something to be canceled because when I talked to staff and I said, oh, why is the meeting canceled? Apparently it was because I said that I had family and I probably wouldn't be here. And so in deference, our nice staff um, said, well, we don't usually meet August and September anyway, so it'll work out fine. So so anyway, why don't we have a motion? So Do you have something? Well, I wanted to comment that um, to back to uh, council uh, member Bigzoik's comment, which is, I actually thought, and I, and I don't know what the procedure is, that we as the council had to be the ones who decided not to have a meeting, and I didn't think we had decided that. So if we need exactly. to actually officially decide not to meet on August the 1st and the day after Labor Day, I think it's up to us to make a motion that we cancel those meetings and vote on them. Because I, I, I don't recall that we did that. That was part of the reason I looked at this and paid attention. So anyway. And that, I believe, is I mean, why I, it was the on. The calendar there. came out that way, and I said, I don't remember voting on that. That's the reason for part of it being there. So. Right. So that's why it's on. So uh, do you want to make a motion? I'll, I'll, I'll move. I'll make that motion. Yes, Madam to we not meet on August 1st and not meet the day after Labor Day. Okay. Is there a second on that motion? All right. I'll second okay. it. <laughs> okay. Uh, vote. Well, discussion. Uh, discussion, yeah. discussion. 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 Yeah. You know, I, I agree. I, I think, you know, if there's we can push business over to the next meeting if we have to. And if there's any need for a special meeting, we can always call that. And you know, I've known that um, Mr. Vixorek's called in and I've had the potential to call in too. So if we need be we can possibly call in. I hate to do it on a vacation, but if it's necessary I, I will do so. Any so, other discussion? I, I, Mr. I guess uh, I'm, Miller? I'm I'm going back to and, and I appreciate skipping the first meeting of both months but staff usually and I don't know if they've done this or not I'm just making an assumption but I, I think over the years they've always assumed they're gonna have that time off it, 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 are we impacting a lot of vacation schedules for staff we don't get, we don't take off until <laughs> well, I'm just, what is this France <laughs> that's not what I was asking if you're taking a whole month off it's but if you planned vacation over these dates and all of a sudden we're telling you you're gonna have a meeting that, that could it's impactful Mr. Daniel will be here to represent all of us. <laughs> and so I guess my question Said is, is the there a problem? assistant city manager who will be on vacation that week. <laughs> is there a problem if we just stay with the, the you know, historical schedule that we just take the entire month of August off plus that first meeting? And if there's something comes up that we need to do, then, then the mayor has the opportunity to call a special meeting. Okay, but the motion is the first uh, I know, meeting. But I'm, I'm having a discussion about oh that if we can do that if that's going to be a problem i mean we're still going to have to vote on that motion or i can amend it okay all right um, i'm under the impression that there are a couple of things that are already on the agenda for august 15 that yes. we probably and in fact we pushed them off of the first and to the 15th that we probably need to deal with right if i'm being asked my personal preference it would be to have the meeting on august 15th to schedule those two agenda items including the parking guy okay then I'm not going to make an amendment. Darn Good it. move. All right. So we have a motion to uh, not meet on the first Tuesday of August or the first Tuesday of September. And is there a second on that? Uh, I was already second. Okay. Oh, I did. Jeez, it's late. All right. Vote. Okay. Motion carries. All right. 
That's the last of our items. Uh, no public comments to continue. Any staff reports? Yes, Madam Mayor, really quick. I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, an event on Sunday, August 6th, that in addition to our uh, concert, we're also gonna have that morning our uh, emergency expo. Um, is we're gonna uh, put in our emergency expo at Sand Park, followed by the concert. And then our police services will be hosting the national night out that evening. So we've got a trifecta of events that night. Um, in addition, uh, our uh, community development folks have put together some uh, materials that we hand out when we uh, go out to uh, look for new businesses for town and stuff. So I thought we'd hand that out to you. They're gonna be debuting a website uh, that they produced uh, for the plan. They're gonna debut it with the planning commission um, and it's the website is at aboutdanapoint.com and it's some good information about Dana Point. So it's an economic development uh, endeavor on our part and we just want to share it with you really quick. I also want to go ahead and recognize, I think she's still in the room, we've got a birthday girl tomorrow. I think we gave her the day off. Jackie Littler, it's birthday's tomorrow. <laughs> And I want to say happy birthday to the mayor a little bit early. So it's coming up this week as well. And that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. And happy birthday to my fellow cancer, right? Um, okay. So um, any other, uh, Mr. Munoz? Uh, yes. Uh, two items I wanted to mention um, publicly. The, uh, as the public's kind of aware and council knows, um, we've been engaged in a series of lawsuits uh, related to sober living homes in town. and. You know, the issue that uh, we've been pursuing uh, is that, uh, you know, it's our belief that they are providing counseling services uh, or affiliated with um, uses um, or, or, or with facilities where counseling services are being provided such that um, in either situation that they should be licensed. Uh, we had a trial, a court trial, um, about a month ago on one of those, which was the Capstrano by the C case, in which we received a very favorable ruling from the court and have prevailed. Um, we've submitted a judgment on that for a permanent injunction or just waiting for that to be signed. In a second case, the uh, SoberTech case, which is the property on um, Evans Point, um, through the efforts uh, of, you know, our office on this case, the, I mean, it's, nobody came out and said this is why they did it, but it's pretty obvious what happened is they just basically uh, abandoned uh, the facility and have left and there's nobody operating there anymore. It's now owned by uh, folks that are just operating as a single family home. So uh, that case is being dismissed. So uh, we're chalking both of those up as victories where the city has had an opportunity to um, simply go out and uh, ask people just to comply with existing state laws with, uh, with respect to these issues. So uh, just to let you know about those. Thank you. Good job. We appreciate that. And where was the second one? Uh, the first one is in Capistrano Beach on Azul, and the second one is off of um, Del Avion, um, yeah, Evans Point is the name of that street over there. Great, thank you very much, You're welcome. good work. Any uh, other staff reports? Okay, so um, I have, uh, Mr. Denny and I spoke before, and uh, I would like to direct staff to um, talk with the task force about regularly meeting and to uh, bring back a report to us at our next regularly scheduled council meeting about uh, the uh, homeless task force, how it would meet, when it would meet, and, and how Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem could be, would be involved in that, uh, in that ongoing task force. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. We have a, uh, the first meeting and, and a pretty um, and size of uh, meeting with Susan Price and others on the 26th of this month. Yes. Uh, I think you announced and it is open to the public. Um, I just mentioned to uh, my fellow members here that after that meeting, we have to determine how to have regular meetings and how to allocate yes. work and move ahead. So we really need to get those as part of that meeting, all the people engaged. Uh, we, I, I think one of the issues is that it's a big group and if you try to put all of them together, you just never get there. So we're going to have to figure out how to work to get a sizable, you know, our, our arms around doing something, right? So. Exactly. And that is what uh, staff will bring back to us at our next regular meeting, a recommendation of what the group should look like, who it should be comprised of, 
and uh, how to meet on a regular basis in deference to, to your uh, committee not meeting regularly. That's all. I have anybody else have anything? Mr. Uh, Miller? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to uh, recognize OCFA and the work they did on the Doubletree fire, and uh, in particular, uh, Italian Chief Pokey Sanchez, Fire Chief Jason Lopez, Fire Chief Justin Neville, Fire Chief Mitch Kahn, and our community risk reduction team of Carl Elman, Eric Elmer, John Bowden, and Matt Job. Our, one of our chiefs are out here, our division chief John Abel is back there. I just want to say thank you for all the work you guys are doing. And I also want to give a shout out to uh, Mark Sutton's team because they play a critical role in trying to keep those businesses open as they go through something like this. Uh, we had a similar situation, was it last summer when Wind and Sea had the same type of fire and we spent a lot of time down there making sure that we could keep them up to code. I just wanted to say thank you for all of that work. Uh, one other thing, I know that um, uh, we've all been invited to the Nigel Shores Men's Club meeting. And did you guys all get that I asked for when Okay, maybe you haven't seen it yet, but you're invited to see uh, Daryl Issa come in and speak. I uh, talked to uh, C.W. Uh, Gruning, the, who's the chair of that committee, and there's a concern about the amount of space that's there, and he would just request that we, the five of us show up individually and do not bring a guest to that because there's not going to be space for guests. So I wanted to point that out, um, but you are invited to that. So, And I, I passed that to Mrs. Ward. Ms. Ward, I thought she sent that out. Uh, I had something else sure it's coming. and it has slipped my mind, but uh, I will get my list of meetings to uh, the clerk. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. Um, oh, I did want to give a, uh, say that the uh, 5th Marine Regiment Support Group uh, is having their annual um, car wash Saturday, the 22nd. Um, at uh, the Doheny Village Car Wash. They do still need some volunteers, so get out there and wash some cars for our Marines. Did anybody else have anything to say? Mr. Tomlinson? Yes, uh, first of all, I'd like to publicly congratulate Mr. Danny on becoming our new city manager, and uh, we, I wish you well in your term as city manager here, and we look forward to working with you. I believe the city council, I echo the other comments already made. And I'd also like to recognize Mr. Killebrew for interim city manager and, and, a, and a good job that he's done. So I'd like to give him a round of applause. <laughs> and I will turn in my list of meetings to the clerk as soon as possible. Mr. Bazork, do you have anything? Thank you, Madam. I have nothing to report. I'll turn in my list of meetings after Great. the meeting. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, I've turned in my list of meetings to the city clerk, but I would like to say that. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Chilton took uh, Mr. Denny and I on a short tour of a, uh, a homeless uh, uh, facility, which uh, they rightfully called uh, uh, a unit to house handicapped people. And if we could look at models that look similar uh, and we can learn a lot from them, I, uh, I'm encouraged that we can get at least some progress made. So we just need to continue to look at what's succeeded, what works, and and work on the problem. And I wanted to thank Mr. or Lieutenant uh, Chilton for taking me on that tour. It was really helpful. Great. Thank you. I did hear about that, and it sounded really interesting. And thank you, Mr. Killebrew. We appreciate everything you've done for the interim period. It was a tough job. It was a tough place to be, and thank you. And I will turn in my list at some point when you keep reminding me. Okay, so uh, do I have a uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, so we are second. Okay, so we're adjourned now until August 15, 2017, 5 o'clock.